Welcome back. I think we are ready to resume the panel and uh, to start with our third speaker. Well, welcome back. Hope you all had a wonderful, enjoyable um, time talking with each other and eating over the lunch. Um, welcome back to our panel. Uh, which is from heritage to creative industry. Um, our next speaker is uh, Luc Luca Zan, who is the director of Joka, which means play, I just found out, uh, Innovation and Organization of Culture and the Arts at, and, uh, at the University of Bologna in Italy. Um, he's uh, uh, been very active in the field of management and accounting history um, with uh, publications on the history of managing practice in proto-industrial settings and management and accounting in historical perspectives. Uh, he's been active in field research on management of arts heritage organizations, sort of meta-heritage kind of, which is really helpful for us um, uh, as we study this, uh, within an international comparative research and he's been doing field work all over the world. It's quite impressive. Um, in China, Turkey, Peru, and Ecuador, and Europe. And he's also teaching in arts management outside of Italy um, at uh, CMU um, and at uh, CAFA, China Academy of Fine Arts. His um, talk is entitled Arts Management, International and Interdisciplinary Perspectives. And um, I want now to uh, welcome, please, uh, Lukasan. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thanks for the invitation to very this very exciting conference. I guess uh, I have less pictures than the previous presenters, and would be a bit more boring in a sense. But that's life. So uh, I'm talking about arts management, which is boring, but so crucial, in, in, as you know. And basically, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to give an account, a short account of what we've done in the last 15 years, both in terms of research and in terms of teaching. And in terms of research, if you're now getting asleep for the, the digestion, the only thing that is come up as uh, I think uh, isomorphism is not here. We are not converging toward the same uh, roots, and the heritage and heritage management of heritage is still going on in very different ways and won't be converging to one single point, especially some points thought at in Washington or some, some place in the West. And the second point on teaching is just trying to see how even a, a small uh, innovation is difficult, but still possible based on our experience. So talking about research in arts management, uh, it's a lot of literature in arts management, very, very little field work, a lot of blah, 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 a lot of w beautiful books and articles, but very little field work, particularly in, in heritage institutions. And you have books that are having few small chapters, three pages, four pages on Machu Picchu, which took us, took us 40, 50 pages to understand and describe what's going there. And what's really missing is any kind of international perspectives. It's impossible, almost impossible, to find a paper that is comparing two museums or two archaeological sites in two different countries. And I think this is a very hidden assumption of we are all similar which is so misleading and dangerous. So let me talk a bit about arts management first and arts comma management and arts management. You know, as we know it, it's a new field, new area, a new uh, disciplinary area developed in the US in the 80s, mostly. But, but, with a lot of buts, art is a bit older. Uh, I mean, art, I mean, I, I'm not defining art. It could be very, very old. But even arts institutions, as we know it, take the Scala, Pompeii, the British museums, they are old institutions, more or less 300 years, years of age. And they have been managed for three centuries without knowing anything about management. 
So when we teach management and arts management, we must give an explanation what we add, what we can add, and how it was possible to manage it, them without management as we know it. So we'll manage in no managerial ways of managing, if you like to place on words. And uh, also management itself, I mean, I, I was in a conference in Liverpool, it was a very nice scorer giving a nice presentation, but with a huge mistake talking about the 60 years of management. 60 years, come on, you lost one zero at least. And I'm doing my research in the Venice Arsenal in the 16th century, where they were talking about the discorso del maneggio. Maneggio is where the terms management come from. And we graduate millions of students all over the world, and they don't even know what the term comes from. So it's coming from Venice in the 14th, 15th centuries. It was using it in terms of handling. Ma maneggiare is handling, literally. And still in Spanish, manejo is a synonym of management. And still, up to the 19th century, manejo was used in this way in Italy. Now it's just for horses. But, so, but management is an old issue. So what are we adding? That's a crucial moral issue when I'm teaching to management uh, uh, students. And even more if I'm teaching to archaeologists or art historians or architects. And also the relationship itself between arts and management is an old one. There was a beautiful exhibition a few years ago in the Palazzo Strozzi in Florence, but money and the beauty, how the Medici was managing both the business, the banks, and the corruption of banks and politics that was already there at that time, and trying to to, 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 to save their souls or their legitimacy by sponsoring art. So it's not an issue invented in the last 60 years. It's been around for 600 years at least. And one of the serious problems in, in, in arts management as a new field is that none of us is coming from arts management. We are, I'm coming from management. Uh, I'm also a, a musician by as I'm a uh, I'm a songwriter, but, but that's not my professional life. Or you come from art. It's so difficult to make these two tradition dialogue. There are no easy solutions. I always tell my students, don't buy, you know, that book say the marketing of arts. Don't buy it. Don't waste money. Don't waste money in solutions that are already given. If marketing and the arts have been separate for 100 years, that is a problem. So, and we're trying to problematize the relationship between management and the arts and open, so, open up discussion more than giving easy solutions. So there is one I very crucial aspect in this history, which is the process of Americanization, of McDonaldization, if you want, uh, and the invasion of b business school as a phenomenon in the last, after World War II in the 60s and 70s, and, and the linguistic domination we all know that there is a paper by Lars Engel in uh, Organization Studies. The title is beautiful, uh, Asterix in the World of Disneyland. And <laughs> that's brilliant. And it was just making a, a, a citation uh, analysis of the 15 most important papers in management, um, journals in management. And what it ends up is that people, authors that are based in Anglo speaking, uh, if I'm allowed to say that, English-speaking uh, institutions cover 92 percent of articles. There's two percent for Israel, then six percent is for South America, Europe, Africa, and Asia. We all know that management is dominated by Anglo-American, but not to this extent. Um, I mean, there are, all, of course, if I'm here, it's because I'm, I love part of it. Uh, but there are also weaknesses. And one of the weaknesses is in, in terms of perspectives. Uh, I mean, they are totally ignoring what was before. As an historian, it's unbelievable how Anglo-American business historians, or e even the most important channel, they don't read any language than English. So they ignore totally what was before. If you, if you go in the, the, the world of art, if you are a musician, you must know Italian. You learn Italian when you, when you read the notation, the old notation. But you must learn Italian if you are an art historian, because it's where the, 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 
Western art has such a crucial role. That's not the case with uh, management scholar, and uh, they don't know anything about European traditions, uh, continental tradition in uh, administrative science, not to say the, 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 the French tradition of sociology of organization, not to say the bad trips in the German countries, they, as it was really nothing before them, before 60 years ago, when invaded the, 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 even the West, part of the West. And one, on the ontological level, uh, th there is a, a, a very crucial aspect, how the kind of relevance of social relationships in organizational, and economic, and social meanings is tend to be hidden. And one of the things I find astonishing, particularly when I'm in China and teaching in China, uh, I was given uh, a pre preliminary version of this speech last year in, in, in at CAFA. And there were this call for paper and the changes in the art sector, whether we should go profit or non-profit. Come on, profit, non-profit. But between profit and non-profit, there is the state. Particularly in China with the Communist Party. It's no joking. It's there. It's an actor. It's a crucial actor. How do we deal with the state? There's nothing in the United States about you know, national policy. They don't even have a, a ministry of culture. That is else the, the rest of the world. State is so crucial in this field. And the changes that are you know, questioning the presence of the state are so crucial and dangerous all over the world in the rest of the world, outside the US. And I think this is really crucial. If you don't understand that, you really misunderstand most of the debate in this area. I mean, in terms of regulation, funding, managing. Uh, uh, let me just uh, skip this. I, 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 one of the things, you know, uh, when I try to, 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 uh, to make my students at Carnegie Mellon University understand what I mean, say, how much is your fee? It's 38,000 euro uh, dollars per year. And our student pays 4,000 or 2,000, depending. So that is the role of the state. Then you can say there are the pros and cons in the two conditions, but are a completely different situation. If you don't understand that, you really risk to, to kill the things. And also what I found in the state is the kind of politically correct ways of explaining uh, heritage and uh, arts uh, the, the, with the, this obsession with mission statement and the mission-driven organization. Come on, mission was uh, is a notion invented in for-profit sector in the 80s or 70s, so there's nothing to do with the good, or, so that's really ideology. What we teach, and we're looking at management, is a more conflictual ways. It's a kind of the initial of managing and organizing, and the very complicated issues of managing uh, organizations. There is an issue of organizational complexity, which is the core base of my understanding. I mean, sense making. Uh, things are not written. There's things are, there are cognitive limits of human being. There are processual approaches. There is bounded rationality. God's wants. I mean, uh, Herbert Simon was the only uh, organizational scholar who got the Nobel Prize. And funny enough, when I'm teaching at Carnegie Mellon, I'm talking about bounded rationality, and my students say, uh, what, what does it mean? And the fact that Herbert Simon was just 200 meters from arts and management uh, building, they don't even, they never heard about him. So that's, you know, and they have leadership and all this kind of blah, blah, blah about skills and without understanding what we're talking about, without understanding complexity and bounded rationality, the issue of emerging strategy, the role of unanticipated consequences of human actions in any organizational context. So I think we need a bit more robust kind of understanding of management from that point of view. And one of the things that we are talking about, I mean, I, I'm unable to read anything about leadership in the state. I mean, it's so naive and so so ideologically. I mean, there's a, if you take uh, uh, some kind of uh, Scandinavian scholars who are more interested in processual approach, talking about very complicated issues 
uh, and they more than leadership of one person, the hero is a question of constellation of roles. It's a kind of more complicated view of managing. Um, interesting, when, when you're talking in China, when you're teaching a bit of management in China, seriously, I mean, trying to understand our, the hidden philosophy that is embedded in our field. Take even the very, very simple tool of SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses, uh, opportunities, and threats. And it's so difficult to use it in China because you have to talk about negative things. You have to address problems. You have to make things what is critical here, and both for Confucianism, perhaps, and both for the memory of what happened with <laughs> in the last 50 years when you were in disagreement, perhaps. It's so embarrassing for Chinese to address problems, which is part of our problem solving. I mean, the notion of control, control, you know, and counter role, it's a negative. It's, I don't trust you. I want to double check. And Chinese do not have the notion of double check. Many of the Excel table that I got, the total was wrong. And I was just making the formula, and I was asking, that, that's, that was wrong. I say, OK, you can correct it. OK. The problem is the, 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 the lack of. So, and, uh, and I tried to do uh, management. I tried to, in any of my books in the last 15 years, I never used the term mission at all. We think, we think my students are not allowed to use it. It's something that was really freezing, uh, making complex things so easy uh, and unproblematic. And, uh, and also, it's so difficult, you know, we have hundreds, millions of criminal organizations. We have the mafia. The mafia had codes of be be behavior, but they are not so stupid at writing them down into any uh, mission statement. That will lo look like any of our <laughs> mission statement. Huh? So. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, uh, interesting uh, aspects, uh, interesting achievements, but I think we are really in a very in, in the need to improve uh, our understanding and, and, and taking management seriously. So, and one particular issue I think we should address is the role of public sector and the belonging of public sector, historically speaking, of most of arts organizations all over the world, apart from the states, and maybe in the states, New Zealand uh, and Australia. But, um, and this is really what we are in, in the mid of, and uh, across with, you know, with other kind of revolution in technology, the, the, the MP3 revolution in music, there is a revolution in administration, which is the cutting down of the end of the welfare state, which is, in a sense, another incredible um, challenge something to cope with, <laughs> and it, I think it's it, it, even more in, difficult. But I want, to put it in a very simple term, if I'm studying Machu Picchu, uh, the Chin Mausoleum of Pompeii, and I'm trying to understand what happened in there in the last 20 years, there are a lot of things that I have to do with the dynamics of the professions, with professional debates within the archaeological, the museological, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of what's happening has to do with the reform of public sector in Italy, Peru, and China or the ways in which public sector is not working here and there. And uh, if we don't address this problem, I, I think we are really in a very unfair situation of kind of what, what I call ironically kind of half Americanization. We get Americanized on the cost side, not on the revenue side. We're just getting cut off our resources and we have to, to manage in, in a managerial way without having access to uh, 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 any philanthropy, there's no philanthropy in, in this century in Italy, very, very small, or any kind of alternative. So what we are looking at, and what we are trying to look at when we are doing our research, we are really taking management seriously, and I think I'm one of the 25 people in management feel interest in history, but also the history of management. We are really taking a micro-focus I'm working on individual entities. I'm working on Pompeii. I'm working on the British Museum, on Machu Picchu. Or I can work on the ministry itself as an organization. So I'm, I'm taking the organization as, as the, 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 the major uh, level of analysis to be very provocative. I'm not that much interest in policies, in cultural policies. I don't care that much about cultural policies. I care about cultural practices. I don't know whether there is an, any, in the mind of any crazy 
ministry in Italy, the decay of Pompeii was a, 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 an explicit design or project or just something that happened. Or when, I, when pol cultural policies are really cultural policy, I'm a bit embarrassed as a Western scholar. When I'm in China or when I'm in Turkey, when someone tells you who to celebrate, whether the Ottomans or the Byzantine period or the Romans, or these are cultural policies. And uh, when, I mean, when they work, I'm scared. I'm really very suspicious and scared. When they don't work, they're the waste of time. So, and I'm talking really about general management. You know, there's this area, museum management, uh, site management, that are kind of hybrid, which have no links anymore with the last 40 years of research and management field. And I also want to understand how restorers work, how archaeologists work. I mean, I'm interested in understanding how things are organized. I never use the term management anymore. When we were talking with archaeologists in, in, uh, in Ephesus, in, in, in Turkey, we were asking them, how do you deal with management of your, and said, I have no time for management. I'm doing my stuff. So uh, people within this field tend to understand management as something else, as making money, as dealing with the visitors. I'm interested in managing and organizing how organizations are run, how time and resources are, in a way or the other, organized. So, and what is particularly interesting in this field is that cultural entities are, more than being uh, uh, mission-driven, are professional organizations that are driven by professional values. Most of the time they are tacit. Most of the time they are universal. So that's why they are so difficult to manage and we as academics, we know exactly, because that's the university, how difficult it is to run a university and a hospital, an arts organization, exactly because of this hidden and universal values. And you have to address the issue of activities, of conditions, of resources, of possibility. The idea itself of budget for a professional organization is kind of, is a scene. How can you budget the life or survival of a patient? It's against your universal value. So that is the problem that we are talking about. I'm talking about economic sustainability, economic feasibility, which not necessarily means uh, profitability at all. So this is, um, I think we, we are, we're going to, I think uh, in the next few days, perhaps, I will make also a presentation of the book that is just coming out uh, of this research, where we were really doing, I mean, there's 15 years of research and doing this kind of field work in countries that are not Anglo-Saxon. And that's important, I love the Anglo-Saxon. I mean, I write song, my songs, I write in English. I'm a member of the Pittsburgh Song Writers Circle. So I love the states, I love the, but I mean, this bias, the lack of attention of how administration works outside the Anglo-Saxon world, and in particular the Roman code-driven uh, reality and in the East is something. So one of the interesting elements in this book, all the field work is outside the mainstream uh, Commonwealth <laughs> legacy, if you want. And these are five aspects that we were trying to address in terms of general issues. That's an issue of managing and change. That's a, a, a global process of change in uh, administration, and we, we are trying to, to see in, uh, how it has an impact in different uh, countries. There is an issue of institutional transformation. All over the world you have new entities with new status and with new hidden, most of the time, business model, which is so crucial to understand how, and when we were doing our research on the Machu Picchu, we spent months to understand where the money comes from, how much is going where. And when we gave our report, uh, our paper to the the, 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 the Roberto Chares, he was the, the, the guy, he, 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 uh, the leader of the project of World Bank on the Vilcanota Valley. I thought, oh, thanks, we never had this information. How, come on, you're the World Bank. Why don't you spend two months of brilliant professors all over the world, Bologna, have suggestions. But how can you manage your millionaire uh, project without understanding where money comes from and where money are used. Then we are trying to develop also a kind of heritage change 
idea. You know, one of the problems in this field that you, uh, I mean, the heritage, I don't need to talk about heritage science because it's so, so, so close to science, and uh, I'm a social scientist, so I'm a humanist, so I'm scared by the word science. And, uh, you know, there is no, uh, 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 so rare to have an opportunity to share our view. There is no, there are few journals, there are few conferences. And, you know, archaeologists have their own stuff, and the museologists their own stuff. Uh, conservators, their own, you know, their own institution, their ways of making careers and so on. So that is what we're trying to develop a holistic approach from the beginning to the end, from the discovery or construction of heritage to the preservation, to the uh, musification, if you want, to the access. And then we are trying to problematize a bit the issue of politics and policies and practices. So uh, just one interesting element, you know, uh, a, few, a, a few findings. I mean, accountability is such a crucial word in the Anglo-Saxon world. There is no way to translate the terms accountability in Italian, in French, in German. So that's really bizarre. And I think accountability itself as a notion has little to do with what's going on in all the rest of the world, in the transformation of the public sector. There are no relevant, no consistent incentive mechanism within broader uh, bureaucratic rules within the countries that I've been working on and studying on. There is a continuous intrusion of politics, which has very different ways. If you are in China, uh, a bit embarrassing uh, in Turkey, even more embarrassing with the you know with the kind of political tension in the last years. I was talking with the director of, of archaeological museum, which kept pressure not to do the exhibition on the Romans, because that's not the period to 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 to, to level on the Romans part of the very controversial identity of Turkey, which is an Ottoman country. Um, or in Italy, the intrusion is a more kind of, you know, uh, uh, it's less dangerous in a sense. It's a buzzword, and the transparency is all over the world. Uh, when you read the paper, the, the, law, the new laws, transparency is everywhere. It's a new buzzword. I love the Anglo-Saxon tradition, the British tradition of uh, information disclosure. You can go on the website of the British Museum, and you just click on the PDF of the financial statement of the last 10 years. It's already there, not just the financial statement. The memos of the board of the, of the trust, the board of trustees. When I was asking the, the, the financial statement of Pompeii, it took me six months with all my connections and pressures that I could mobilize. Turkey. By law, you can get any information. You have the right as a citizen after 15 days. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Are you joking? And China. I mean, there is a bias in our, in our uh, even in the heritage. We, are, we always talk about heritage as a part of the democratization of the world, of, you know, when we're talking about the community participation. Uh, uh, I have experience, long time experience, in illiberal countries. Uh, I, I, I love uh, having access to uh, uh, internet uh, uh, w w with freedom, without any censorship. I love freedom, but it's not the word. I mean, I think we should be very careful when we talk about archaeology and heritage to, to take the part for the whole. There's a part of the whole where democracy, uh, legitimation, or participation is a value. There are other parts of the world that are not relevant issues. So what I'm, in terms of research, what I really like to, to develop is a kind of call for ethnography of administrations. There is no a way in which administrations work to, to be the same way. There's no one way. We have to understand when we're coming, if I'm coming to Singapore, I have no idea how Singapore works. I will try to understand, to reconstruct from the field. There's no way to understanding and to impose predefined solution. There are legacy. There is administrative heritage also. I mean, heritage is not just the, the, the bodies of things, and, or, or it's the way you deal with. It's kind of very difficult to deal with 
intangible heritage, but administration, long-term administration, is part of the picture, and we have to deal with it. And uh, we have to understand, and we have to spend a lot of uh, work in, in terms of the field analysis, understanding tacit knowledge, hidden processes, uh, and, and, and so on. And the, the risk of killing this uh, 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 organization that are so fragile, so based on long-term tacit understanding of tacit knowledge, that when you're touching them, Jesus Christ, what's going to happen? So, and particularly, uh, it's really the relevance of context. And what is really, uh, if, you, if you ask me 10 years ago when the, the reform of Pompeii was starting, perhaps my, perhaps no, I voted, so it's not perhaps. I thought that were the process of change was long, difficult, but it was that way. I don't think we are converging anymore. I, well, I think we pretend to convert for a few years, but Italy will move in a different way. China will never move according to the idea of independence, autonomy of museums, director, come on. That's, that's not an issue at all in, for the next 40 years, even in Turkey. So we should be very careful of our own historicity and, and the differences. So convergence is not an issue. So, and this has, of course, implication when you teach. Because this variety is what we have to deal with. And you have to present to your students. You know, I'm teaching Carnegie Mellon uh, also, uh, and I love Carnegie Mellon. Uh, we have, they have 30, 40 percent of Asian students. They don't teach anything about the Asian. I mean, they don't know anything about Asian. And they're really teaching what they know and what is the American. And I think that is really unfair way to, 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 to do our teaching. So just. Uh, starting, we, uh, it's almost 14 years we are teaching a, a Joker. We, uh, we start with the Bologna reform process. You know, very, very crazy issue. The labor market, even in Europe, is so fragmented. We don't, we have people getting, the age of people getting in the market is different because of the different administrative legacy. So that's the revolution of the Bologna reform. The three plus two, uh, the bachelor and the master as a uniform system all over Europe, so that in, to, incur, to have a situation where people get in the labor market at the same age, a revolution, a revolution with our huge history. And we did try, and we make something new in, the, in Italy, which is a, a, a master degree, which is not related to any undergraduate, any bachelor, which is very normal in the state. It's totally out of the tradition of the Italian system. So if you've done the bachelor, you do the, 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 the same thing. So we're doing arts management, and you could come from any any kind of uh, bachelor. We just want you to be smart. That's it. When I, a student called me, well, how can I prepare for the selection? Be, become smart if you're not smart, or <laughs> whatever. Try to, you know, but what shall I study? Forget it. It's not that's the problem. We are making you. And, understand. and that was the revolution we did was transforming the course in English. As you, as you say, as you probably realize, my, uh, I have a kind of love and, and hate uh, relationship with English. But it's really both. And I think that if you don't teach in English, you're simply marginalized. I mean, as, uh, expecting that people will learn Italian, it's a waste of, it's a dream. So we are out of the market in terms of language. So people can come and we could teach something which is a bit different, which is part of our identity inside, and which is some criticism to the language domination, but we have to do it in English. So, and that is what we did. And, and what we try to do is developing knowledge and skills. That's an issue, because we are, uh, the, 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 it's a, so two, two different things, developing knowledge and skills. And skills is something, and you can have people with so skilled without any knowledge. I still remember once of my students at Carnegie Mellon, she was a lover of contemporary art. She never heard about the Venice Biennale. Uh, well, that skills, perhaps. <laughs> How can you survive without that? It's already a skill in itself, but we need knowledge. You know, uh, they don't teach art history. How can you be in this field without knowing how to history or music? How can you? So, um, 
what we think is we, this is just a last option that they have to open to be open their mind. We are not, you know, we are just teaching. We are not preparing people to the, I mean, of course we do some placement, we do relationship with business, but we still kind of European notion of education. It's not we are providing you a job, we are providing you knowledge and skills. And so that's up to you, to your luck, and to your connections to, to see if you're able to make it. And what is really a, a, a crucial point, we. I hate specialization. Specialization is a, a, a disease, is an irreversible disease. And so when you start, you never end. So we don't want people that I'm just interested in contemporary art. I don't care. There are museology, there are cinema. There are, so we provide a lot of. We don't want specialists. We, I have, we have the idea that arts and arts disciplines are less and less divided and will be less divided in the future. So. Specialization has no value. We do a lot of inter, international, interdisciplinary, but one of the most difficult is inter theory and practice, particularly in the field of management. It's so difficult, the relationship. Uh, so we're doing research-based teaching. We are involving a lot of researchers doing uh, field work. We are involving professionals uh, also uh, doing, for doing that. And what I think is one of the best, you know, uh, the best solution to one of the problems, which is the difficult cultural uh, fragmentation in, in the arts field, is really both in terms of uh, geographical provenance of, of our students, and uh, so we really have students from uh, a lot of the countries, and. Uh, it's funny when you when you're there, you cannot teach anymore about Italy. Who cares about Italy? Okay, Italy is a nice place, to be sure. It's also important historically speaking, but it's one case. You cannot be focused on your country. You cannot be. Why teaching about the U.S.? Why teaching about China? If we are really thinking of kind of, uh, sorry, of international and also particularly in terms of background, uh, th that I love. And when we do that presentation, we make the student present themselves. Uh, different races, which is quite unusual in our country, just something happened in the last 10 years, uh, different uh, backgrounds, completely different geographical and professional past. And this, you put these guys together, and they learn to live in a world of variety and differences before uh, having their strong identities to, to, to live and to save. So, uh, uh, I mean, I, um, I don't want to run out of time, but it, it, really the, the kind of interdisciplinary approach, both in terms of uh, uh, you know, humanist, economics, legal, and management, it, it's something that we are really trying to, 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 to work on. And uh, also in terms of this difficult, uh, difficult, way, uh, difficult to manage uh, variety uh, of uh, the faculty, teachers from Unibo, teachers from uh, international universities, and professional for the field. Uh, let me skip this, and this I, I can leave the the the, 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 um, the slide, but just to give an idea of what we're trying to do, uh, and, and the variety of things that we are trying to to teach. There are crash courses in management, and we do on management a lot of things in terms of crash courses as the basic, so it's a full immersion in the first month and a half, uh, but we really don't want to, 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 to be dominating in this area too much. And in the second year also, we have all this, uh, and the laboratory is mostly done by, by professionals, and we have a, uh, the final semester is in uh, full-time internship and a project-based dissertation. Then we have a lot of uh, uh, field visits. It's nice to be in Italy. Uh, uh. It's nice to be in Bologna. With two hours, you can get everywhere. And you can get to Rome, to Venice. I'm taking my students in the Venice Arsenal, even in the part of the Arsenal which is close to the public, which is the Navy. I have to write to the dear Ministry of Defense, can I? Uh, so, because it's a foreign student. Uh, but, and we have a lot of uh, these visits. We do a lot of I I initiatives from that point of view. Also, we run an open mic 
which is very unusual in, in Italy. It's very normal in the States and the, in the UK, something to do with the Anglo-Saxon. That's a part of Anglo-Saxon that I love because I play when I'm in the state in open mics and so on, and uh, try to do various, and what we do really is a lot of international collaboration. You know, we have Erasmus. Erasmus is perhaps the, the most clever things that Europe ever organized, a very easy, way of exchanging students, and we do exchange students all over Europe. We have 10 of our 30 students that are moving, uh, and we have also this two pro main project. One is with the Carnegie Mellon University. We have a double degree. Some students can take a double degree. They spend one year in Bologna and one year in Pittsburgh. So they have a, 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 a very, very different, and I think shocking, uh, understanding of how these two parts of the world can work, and we are also having this strategic relationship with uh, CAFA, the Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing. I'm teaching there, some uh, colleagues from China comes, and some students also. Uh, so, um, just to conclude, I mean, in terms of teaching, there are open issues. Uh, well, when you have this class, it, it's a mess. It, it's a mess, because it's so fascinating, it's so interesting and stimulated, but it's so different in terms of culture. I mean, the way in which a student behave, uh, from the arrogance of the ones that pay $38,000 and perceive themselves as client, to the Asian that are so nice and so respectful, <laughs> something that is totally unusual for us in, in Europe. So that is a problem in itself. Uh, in terms of history, you know, we do not know anything about our own history but we know even less about others' history. So when you have this, I mean, they don't share anything. You have students from Turkey, China, America, North America, sorry, uh, French, uh, Netherlands, Italy. How you do some basic understanding of, of, of the world. So that, that's one of my courses, it's lovely. It's, it's crazy, I mean, it's, it's impossible, but it's against nature, but it's so fascinating in terms of expectation, the use of different level of service, and so on. In terms of labor market, you have to take into account, and it's not easy. I mean, we have serious problem in Italy, is a very serious problem in terms of labor market. I mean, all my students every, everywhere else go to their country and find a job. In Italy, they have very, very, very temporary, very new forms of employment. We call it the kind of euphemism. No, it's, really temporary and uh, really kind of unsafe jobs, but they, they find more than, than, than others. So, so there's a, a huge uh, difficulties in managing a course like that. I mean, all the intern, interdisciplinarity, inter theory and practice, international, is so difficult to manage. All of us want to talk about their own stuff. And then Trying really to have a respect of this kind of dialogue is so difficult. As a director, I spend a lot of time in management this kind of conflicts. And always the, there is no this idea of reciprocity. I mean, we are interested in going abroad. It's impossible to have someone from the UK. It's so difficult to have students from the States. They are not used, they are not interested in what is uh, happening elsewhere. So, and it's so interesting to have interdisciplinary views, but go to archaeological department, go to the history department, you can graduate in history without any other f course than history. They don't, teach, they don't study economics, management, organization, politics, no, nothing. So most of the time, I mean, these very old-fashioned uh, disciplinary boundaries are so narrow even, I, I would say the humanists can be really crazy from that point of view. You can graduate in philosophy nowadays without studying one month economics. Whether you like or not, economics had a huge impact in the life of people in the last 500 years. You could not become a philosopher without studying economics, I guess. So uh, it's really a serious problem. But also, uh, I mean, they are <laughs> dealing with the bureaucracy. I was inventing this word in one slide before, bureaucracy. I mean, all this issue is done with a yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, finished. It's done with an over-regulated framework and, and over-regulated countries and over-regulated continents. So anything you do, it's so easy. I mean, it took me 18 months to get the 
double degree signed by the rector. So everything is very complicated. Uh, and, and, and any change is so difficult to, 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 to be done and to preserve. But just one thing I want to, to come back and I'm ending with this. When we are, th there is one thing in particular in this area which is very difficult uh, and, and is one of the trade-offs that we, have, we, we all deal with, whatever the solution we find, is that what we teach is related to what we don't. Assuming that the time is limited and the resources are limited, we cannot teach everything. So whatever we teach, we don't teach something else because the time is limited. So if we want to introduce a new course on information technology, what should I get rid of? And that's it's a very crucial point. And I was talking, we were joking uh, uh, at lunchtime with Italian friends, uh, and, and I was one of another students in, in, uh, in an American university, I won't make their name, but they were running a kind of laboratory in, in uh, contemporary art. And none of this voluntary student, you know, doing their voluntary job with this blah, 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 none of them as a single course in arts history. So there are the skills of running this without knowing. So when I was joking with her, they, they know how without having the know what. And this is a serious, damn serious problem. And I was fascinated by your presentation this morning, but I was thinking, what shall we teach? And when you teach some of this, you, you, what you are giving up, art history? So I mean, the, the, the issue and uh, it's so crucial because uh, uh, th there is an issue of what we teach in the class and how we deal with multidisciplinarity in this way, in the sense that we cannot make a, the new man, you know, the, the global culture man, the new Renaissance man or woman, uh, is not possible. We have to make compromise, and we have to, maybe there's something that we have to defend, something that is, I would say, not negotiable. You cannot give up to art history if you want to teach art or arts management or whatever. So there is kind of history that you cannot give up. But in any case, if you give up to this community of students, how you rebuild the knowledge that is necessary. I think it's a never ending uh, struggle that all of, you, of us are dealing with. Thank you.